Hello, and welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 218th episode, our guest is T.E. Breitenbach. T.E. Breitenbach, born in 1951 in Queens, New York, is a self-taught American artist best known for his painting, Proverb Idioms, a raucous and comical depiction of over 300 common proverbs and cliches. He also collaborated with Jim Morrison of The Doors shortly before Morrison's 1971 death on a painting intended for use on his An American Prayer album. T.E. Breitenbach was the youngest person to receive a Rome Prize Fellowship in Visual Arts. Inspired by the castles and museums of Europe, he returned home determined to build a castle studio to house his art and eventually become a museum. During the planning stages, he painted Proverb Idioms and later published it. He also writes musicals and in 2016 produced Hieronymus, a musical fantasy, the story of an artist with a too large imagination, available as play on demand on PBS. His websites include tebreitenbach.com and ourmusical.com. And now on to the show. For people that don't know who you are, though, would you mind just go ahead and just introduce yourself real quick? Oh, my name is, uh, I go by the name T.E. Breitenbach. I'm best known for a uh, painting I did, um, posters, which I sold a quarter million of called Proverbidiums. It's uh, full of uh, common sayings, like a carrot and a carrot. See, why would you eat my head with a little threaded neck is... Um, You'd forget your head if it wasn't screwed on, things like that. <laughs> also, yeah. I also had a painting I did with Jim Morrison of the Doors. I've also been building a castle out in upstate New York, uh, all by hand, from the materials from the property. Uh, and, oh, and I have a music. I have a musical on PBS about my favorite artist, Geronimo Spaff. <laughs> That's incredible. See, yeah, when I when I found out all those things about you, I, I was like, I have to talk to this guy. I've got so much. <laughs> That's that's what an interesting person. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but going back to the start of uh, your career, uh, you seem like you've always had kind of uh, building and architecture and kind of, you know, that kind of thing has always been in your life just because of your family background, right? Right. My father was an architect. Both my parents were very artistic. Uh, and then we built our own house when I was about 11 years old. I didn't do much myself, but I got to watch and uh, also helped my father do some construction when I was uh, on my summers uh, off from college and whatnot. Uh, I was a full-time draftsman in his office for one summer before college and uh, I helped him cast concrete foundations and things like that. So I learned a lot of building skills that I could use later on. Yeah. It says here you built five grandfather clocks, a harpsichord, a clavichord, and two music boxes. Oh, that was in high school. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that's incredible. Yeah, so not just the out outer and you're getting into the interior parts too. It's it's amazing. You have to have a very mechanical mind, I guess, to to think about it that way. I, well, that's why I feel like having art classes is important for people when they're young. Uh, if you learn how to see something in your mind and then and then make it happen, make it real, uh, that's a that's a skill you can use over and over again. You just have to learn new rules for depending on the discipline you, you want to get into definitely and um even before i knew that you had done that musical about Hieronymus, Hieronymus bosch i of course the i see your your work and i can see the direct influence he's also one of my favorite artists too um talk a bit about how a little bit about how you discovered salvador dali and, and Hieronymus bosch and and kind of people that set you on your path as far as an inspiration, you know? Sure. Well, I wasn't really interested in becoming an artist at the time when I was in high school. I was, uh, for, when I was 12 or 13, I wanted to be an entomologist, a person who studies <laughs> insects. Wow. I had a really big insect. We moved to the country when I was, uh, from the city when I was like uh, 10. And uh, so it was quite spectacular, all the, all the nature and the wildlife. Uh, and then I used to like, <clears throat> excuse me, like watching uh, shows like Perry Mason. I, when I was a senior in high school, I applied for law school. <laughs> wow. Uh, but eventually I, I switched to architecture. Um, 
I forgot the topic here. I'm I'm getting old. <laughs> no, that's okay. I was just asking about your artistic influences and who kind of set you oh, set you yeah. off when you were a kid. Yeah. 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 So um, uh, the th- thing is, I was doing those grandfather clocks, and so I had to teach myself how to paint because uh, I was doing roses and things on flowers on the dials, and uh, I was just imitating uh, some greeting cards that I had. But my my painting turned out to be much more realistic than the card, just, just by accident, because I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, but I discovered, you know, if you exaggerate the shadows and the so forth, you can really make those images pop out. Uh, mm-hmm. so, and at the same time, so that's how I taught myself to paint. But at the same time, I was, uh, I, I, uh, one of the students at my school did a talk about Salvador Dali, and I had never heard of him. Uh, I was more familiar with some of the modern artists because of some of the museums we'd gone to when I was in New York. Uh, and, I, and I tried some of that, some of the abstract art. Mm-hmm. Dali, you know, the paintings were so bizarre. And, and then I shortly after that found out about Hieronymus Bosch in this garden of earthly delights. My parents had an art book on our shelves with the, the painting in it. Um, so I immediately started doing some canvases that summer before I went to, to college. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, I, so I ended up, though, applying to uh, architecture school. I was a full-time draftsman that summer before college. My father had a, his office in a, the basement of our home, so I got to be, uh, got to look over all the workers' shoulders and <laughs> learn how to draw plans, and I was constantly making the plans for some, my future house. Mm. Uh, uh, but when I went to Notre Dame, I already knew how to do this stuff, so I was kind of bored silly, but I was definitely into all these paintings I was doing. <laughs> And I put them into a student art show there. And nobody knew who I was. And I was just listening, but they were like surrealism. And I was just listening to all the comments. And <laughs> I got really excited about this weird stuff. Oh, this guy's on drugs. My <laughs> was a chemistry major. I don't know where they get these things from. <laughs> <laughs> but I was amused by it. Yeah. But you're playing, uh, you're, you're playing guitar all this through this time, right? Growing up. You're, or, and not just guitar. You're playing other instruments too, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, my mother taught me the mandolin, and then I learned some snare drum and uh, flutophone in, in the, or recorder, I guess is the proper name, uh, in, in, in school. Uh, and then I learned uh, guitar on my own. She taught me some piano, but I never learned to read music for it. But I, you know, I'm good on the piano, composing things and stuff. It actually helps. <laughs> mm. When I did those musicals, I have this friend who's, who's been a child prodigy in music since he was, since I knew him at around age 10 or 11. And, uh, but he told me it's hard for him to compose a song because, uh, you know, he, he, he can just sit down and play anything you ask him to without any sheet music, all, all 12 fingers. Blah, 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 blah. He can play two songs at the same time. <laughs> but so he never knows if he's making up a new tune or if he's uh, something just coming through his uh, subconscious that he already knows. Mm. Whereas me, I, not, not knowing all the fingering very well, I, uh, I know what the chords are and so forth. But, uh, so I create a lot of happy accidents. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually a nice way to write songs. You come up with some original things. So that's what mm-hmm. I started doing. Right. But you, you were into the doors right away as soon as you heard them, right? I mean... Yes. Yeah, so in high school, I was in a rock and roll band. And I taught myself lead guitar. So I was kind of Robbie Krieger. But we were really into the doors. Mm-hmm. And, we played most of their songs, and we even renamed our band uh, Persian Night after one of his lyrics. I forgot wow. The song that's, um, nice. Yeah. And, but you, yeah, but you, uh, you reached out to Jim Morrison just kind of out of the blue, right? You just kind of cold called him, right? Uh, after I was in college just the one year and had really developed my art skills and made some nice paintings, um, I think I, I think what happened is I, bought his new book that he came out with, uh, Lords and the New Creatures, a poetry book. Mm. You know, I was always impressed with his, with his uh, lyrics. You know, they're always a little bit crazy, a little bit surrealistic. So just out of the blue, I decided to <laughs> write him through his record company, Electra, and see if uh, he might be interested I, in uh, having me do a free, free painting uh, for one of their album covers. Mm. And he, so I was just a sophomore, and I was just starting out. and. Uh, Early October, he wrote me back. I was really surprised. He said, let's do it. And he wanted me to do a triptych, that, which is a th- three-paneled painting. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and he gave me the ideas, for, especially for the side panels. He was very specific in the center. Uh, he, 
he was a little more general, so I borrowed things from his poetry and so forth. But mm. uh, kind of hellish visions, actually, uh, in the in the middle panel. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, he liked it, and he wrote back and asked me for uh, uh, some color transparency. So I sent him that, and then uh, then in March I, I got a. Uh, letter from his secretary saying he had moved over to Paris and then he ends up dying oh, and, and, but that he wanted to use it on his album of poetry so but then he ends up dying and uh, the album came out uh, it was called the American Prayer his poetry album came out seven years after he died and by, mm -hmm. that, time, by that time they had lost contact with me and I didn't know where he didn't know where the transparency was or had a cop contact me you know there's no internet back then right <laughs> had no website or anything like that it was, everything was harder yeah <laughs> my initials um <sighs> but i just i actually just learned this only a few years ago there's, there's a big resurgence and in, in interest in him right now i've been approached by a number of people i just got this painting published in a there's a limited edition of 2000 uh, books and, and it's this fabulous book. They have imitations of his actual notebooks. They they got hmm. the stuff from the state and it's ne had never been seen before. Wow! A six hundred page book and it's all wrapped up really cool. Uh, but it's got the picture of my painting and the, and the letters from him. And then John, uh, no, uh, what was his name? Um, Frank uh, Lissandro, his friend, uh, wrote in that book that yeah he he remembers Jim telling him that T. Bright he had T. Bright and Mug was making the triptych for the for the album cover mm. uh, for this uh, but, but that's what i say that's what i say about it. Uh, mean but meanwhile i got uh and two other authors contacted me and one wants to use it on the title on the, on the cover and, wow. one, and then the spanish documentary company contacted me they were writing a documentary about jim's last days in europe and what he did mm. And, and this is where I learned out that he was connected to Rano Spash, and that is why he was so interested. Wow, okay. So what she told me was that uh, they were going to come over and interview me, but uh, then they lost their funding for that, and then the, then the, then the you know, the coronavirus came out. So mm -hmm. I don't know what the status of that is, but what she told me was that his doctor, he'd been coughing up blood, and his doctor told him to, you got to take a vacation, Jim. Go go find a nice dry climate and, and spend some time there. So he and mm -hmm. Pamela rented the car, and there was three places he wanted to visit. And, and the main one was um, the Prado, the art museum in Madrid, where Hermann Spasch's Garden of Earthly Delights is. And I learned from them that he had written an art uh, paper about Hermann Spasch mm. uh, for college, and uh, yeah, so he was really into into that stuff. So that that explains why. <laughs> Why my pictures were a hit when I sent them to him. Oh, it's just too bad they didn't uh, know where to find the images after they finally came out with it. Yeah, right. Um, but that's amazing. That that's incredible. Yeah, no, I can totally see um, how he would be into Verano's Bosch uh, just based on the poetry and, and lyrics and stuff. It seems like the the dark uh, visions. Uh, I just love the way Hieronymus Bosch's paintings look. I love, I love how it's simultaneously completely realistic and yet totally grotesque and imaginary, but like somehow fused together. It's, it's really amazing style. So, well, so I ended up writing a musical about Hieronymus. Yeah, that's what's on PBS right now. Cool and partly autobiographical. <clears throat> um, apart from helping my father years ago, I have never had a job. I've always worked for myself. I've been wow. really lucky. That's incredible. Uh, Robert Bidding's painting was a big hit when I published it. But, uh, but um, my wife used to ask me, how can you stand to be home alone all the time? Myself? And I, I tell her, I t would tell her, because I'm not home. <laughs> Meaning you get so absorbed into these worlds you're creating as an artist that you don't even think about your surroundings anymore. And sh she could come home and find me laughing or crying or, you know, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> getting into some scene or maybe some dialogue for one of my musicals or, or whatever. Yeah. So, so this musical is actually about uh, his, his imagination is so large that all these creatures he invents for his paintings are alive and they live in his house. Hmm. And when he falls in love with a girl from the real world, <laughs> how do you explain this stuff? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go hide all you guys. Go hide. <laughs> uh, it's a romantic comedy and there's a villain in there that also is one turn. Hmm. A lot of fun, and uh, PBS accepted it uh, 
It's been on there about three and a half years. Uh, Play on demand, if you look it up. Uh, you can actually, cool. have, actually have an easy website that people can go to, OurMusical.com. It's okay. Got links. It has links on there for it. Cool. And also the trailers and uh, an, aha, an aha piece they made about the making of the, of the musical. But I want to talk about Proverb Idioms. It's just such an incredible work because you've got, like you, you get so, uh, like you said, I can see how you get so involved in the details. Uh, how did you come up with the idea? First of all, how long did it take? How, did you have a limit of how many you wanted to include in one painting? Were you like, I can't, I can't fit another one of these in here? It was a little harder back then without the internet. Uh, you know, yeah. I found some books and I kept asking friends, uh, you know, collect all the sayings that you can go. The, what got me onto this topic, though, the, there was a, another painter who my paintings actually resemble more than they do Bosch's, uh, Peter Bruegel. Mm. He did a painting of Dutch, pro, Dutch proverbs. And uh, he wasn't original with the idea. It was actually kind of a fad back, back then in, in, in mm. the area, area where he lived. And there was a fellow who did a big engraving. And I see some of the same Im images in both pictures. Um, but... Um, uh, I was reading a, a, a review of that painting, and the, the fellow commented how colorful language was back then. And I started to think about, about all the weird things we say, all the cliches and all the puns and, and stuff in our language. In fact, I've been told by uh, the people that ended up taking my one of the, one company used to take my painting to a hundred different countries where they're teaching foreigners how to l learn English. But mm. we we confuse the heck out of people because we use so many cliches when we talk. I started to think about it. And yeah, we have so many colorful sayings of our own. I, this guy is crazy. So it, it became a challenge for me. <laughs> it would be so popular, but I had so much fun doing it. And it took about a couple of years. I was still living at home at the time. I mm -hmm. was 25 years old. Wow. Started taking it to some craft shows and things, but I couldn't get people to go away. <laughs> they got involved with it. And finally, mm. said, you got to make a poster of this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that got me started. And, uh, that was a good. That was a good way to go. So I've been able to keep all my paintings all these years, uh, and I'm I put them in a trust along with the castle I've been building to be a museum one day. That's that's my final wish. Um, and I had about a dozen other paintings uh, with different sayings in it, like uh, with different different topics. So there's one about uh, food and recipe names, one about plant and flower names, one about uh, computers. In fact, IBM asked me to do one about computer jargon. Wow. Uh, I'd have one with Shakespearean quotations and uh, one I called a picture of health, the medical terms of things. So, yeah, so that was, so they're, they're, they're just very funny to look at. I paint them quite literally, as you got to figure them out. And I put a list on the bottom of the posters and people have good fun with them. I've gotten so much great uh, email over the years and people like, like a couple bunch of lawyers from California, they had bets going. They want to know, they'll know where the answers were for this. <laughs> Another lady whose son had just died, but he, she saw him in my Shakespearean, Shakespearean poster. It's called Shakespearean. Mm. And, and the one figure who was being dumped into the water was uh, looked just like her son and, and her, her other son who was helpful and, uh, she ended up sending me a whole binder full of uh, things about that painting that really touched her. So wow. I've been deeply grateful. I don't, I don't really have a big ego about this. I'm just so grateful that I, you know, I feel blessed that uh, people like my work and, <laughs> and uh, I will, will give it back in the end. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, is there ever a time where you complete one of these and then you're like, Oh, I forgot one, <laughs> or I just heard a new one that would work. Would have worked great. No, I start the list for my next. You start the next one, right? 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 Yeah, I, I did four four power videos paintings. Wow. Okay. Got you. Numbered power videos two, ultimate power videos, and power videos four. Who missed the boat? <laughs> so, are you are you planning the fifth one, or is it over? Are you done? You think you got them all? <laughs> I do have a list going. But... Oh, you do. Okay. I don't think I live that long to do all all the paintings. You should see my to do list. <laughs> yeah, I bet three, three other musicals, a play, uh, a whole bunch of paintings. I still want to do. Right now, I'm doing. Uh, before I, I connected with you, I was just uh, transferring my drawing to a large panel. It's going to be my biggest painting ever. Wow! It's called pure imagination. This time, there are no sayings, no allegories, no jokes. 
Mm. So there's houses that are alive and there's creatures and it's just going to be uh, just for fun. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Um, and then you've got, uh, you, you mentioned the jigsaw puzzle element. When did that come about? Who suggested that to you? Oh, well, I, at one point I, I got an agent from Albany and he, uh, he contacted bits and pieces first. It was a big company and uh, they sold 40,000 jigsaw puzzles <clears throat> and they did a contest. So it kind of wasn't fair. I guess the posters are already out, but people have to guess how many find all the posters and, uh, and find all the sayings in the, in the thing. One lady, it only has like 306. One lady came up with 700 <laughs> sayings. Mm. Why we're in that painting? Wow, it was it was it's always entertaining. Tell me about you mentioned your castle a little bit, but tell me about that project because that's just amazing that you've that you've taken on such a long term building uh, situation. Like, what was your uh, initial plans for it? How have they changed over time? What's been some of the hardest part? Sure. Well, I've always been interested in. The- <clears throat> building my own home, having learned those skills from my father. And um, when I was so, about 12 years old, me and my mother built a, a, probably a couple hundred feet of uh, stone, dry stone also uh, for, for mm-hmm. plantings around my father's house. He built a very modern Frank Lloyd Wright style house with big overhangs and so forth out of Redwood. And I always thought I'd live in a, like I said, when I was just studying architecture from him, I was actually designing my own house to, to, just for fun. I did that at college too. Mm -hmm. Um, But when it finally came to it, uh, uh, oh, well, well, I I switched out of architecture and I was in in an independent art program at Notre Dame for two years. And then I became the youngest person, but I painted better than all, I painted better than all the professors. So it was kind of silly. And my, uh, in the independent study, I just stayed in my room and painted and then I'd show them my work every couple of weeks. But the guy is asking me, how, how do you do this? How do you do this? Yes. It was kind of ridiculous. I applied for a Nome Prize Fellowship, and I became the youngest person to ever win one. Wow. So at age 20, I went to Italy for a year. And I traveled. I got to see the Prado Spash of the Prado and southern Germany and the different places I liked. Uh, Barcelona. And I don't know if you know Anton- Antonio Gaudi's architecture. Holy no. Mm-mm. I'll have to look that up. Very fanciful. Antonio Gaudi. And very fanciful stuff, uh, surrealistic. <laughs> um, but when, so I visited all these castles too in southern Germany. You know, the King Lud- Mad King Ludwig, they used to call him. Uh, he did the Schloss Neuschwanstein, which, which inspired Disney World's uh, castles. Yeah. And when I came back, uh, I, I gave up the second year. I wanted to come home and start building my house. So my father had bought land years ago when he moved up here. Unbelievably, for thirty-five dollars an acre, nobody wanted this stuff. We really were in the sticks. There weren't any malls around or anything else. We were in the middle of nowhere. And um, he bought another. He bought seventy-eight acres. He bought another thirty uh, a few years later for hundred dollars an acre. And that, that's what he ended up giving me. And I, uh, I didn't have a lot of money at the time, but I had the ambition, and I had all the stone I could ever want on the property. There's a creek and a waterfall in the back of the property, and there's. Uh, Every time you dig, you dig up rocks. Mm. I don't literally don't have a, uh, any footings for my house. The, 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 the stone was just built right onto the, the bedrock. Wow. And then I had all these uh, oak trees in the woods and maples. I cut up for cabinets and moldings. And, and then I took down a neighbor's barn uh, that was collapsing for all kinds of siding and things. I'm getting ahead of myself, but... Uh, I came across a book called The Octagon House by Orson Fowler and started a fad in Victorian times. It was written in the late 1800s. I don't know what it's like where you live, but up in here, the several villages that have at least one octagon house in it, mm. inspired by this book. But he talks about how practical it is to uh, approach a circle when you build because you have the least amount of exterior surface. Um, it's cheaper to build, it's cheaper to heat. Uh, and then put that together with the stone and it kind of spells castle. <laughs> it looks like a castle or a fort. So I decided to start there. Plus I wanted my artwork to be, I wanted my house to be fireproof. So mm. I literally cast uh, all the basement walls. I cast a basement ceiling on a concrete. Uh, 
and then and then build for the stone. And uh, most of the inside walls are all concrete, uh, covered with uh, white stucco. I had a friend uh, in Italy though who lost twenty years of his artwork because his studio burned down. So oh, that's terrible. Well, I thought a castle was a good plan. Yeah, uh, very fanciful. Something can let your imagination go on a bit. So we built the octagon first. It was 36 feet across with a uh, 40, 45 foot tall tower and a flagpole. And um, <clears throat> 10 years later, I needed studio space. So I added on an even larger wing out the, out the back. Actually, we're up to about 7,000 plus square feet here. Mm. And uh, so I have lots of uh, workspace, uh, indoor gallery, and I have uh, a, a wood shop and a really large studio with 22 foot ceilings. Lovely place. Amazing. I'll be part of the museum one day. Cool. It's hard starting a museum though, because while we're living here, I can't really open it to the public. And so I can't get an, a museum charter in New York State until less we're open to the public. So mm. I attempted to. Uh, I designed a museum building I could build down the driveway and we could have still have the paintings on display at least and have some uh, exhibit space and, and uh, public space and so forth. But uh, I, I couldn't raise that. I don't think I can raise that kind of money. <laughs> There's going to be a couple million dollars. So I don't have the right circle of friends. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's just incredible. Uh, now, what was like, did you do the electrical as well, like the, the plumbing and all that too? Yeah, I wow. had a of skills. I did the electric plumbing and built all the cars, uh, built a lot of the furniture, built another grandfather clock for here. <laughs> sure you had to teach yourself all sorts of new disciplines just to just to finish the thing, right? <laughs> In the end, you apply your imagination, but every, dis every discipline has some rules to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only so many ways you can do a painting to make it look real, and there's only so many ways you can miter corners to make a frame or a grandfather clock and, and, and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it helped to like that my, to watch my father do a lot of this stuff. Yeah. I know they did some painting two years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, do you ever have, like, people have weddings or anything there now? Actually, we did open up a wedding business here. Cool. We have a website, rentourcastle.com, but with the <laughs> pandemic and yeah. ruining the lawns all the time, we kind of gave up on it. We, we still have the uh, res we still have ceremonies here and, and uh, mm -hmm. different workshops. We just had a really cool workshop from aspiring models and photographers, and, and and they set up all kinds of. I have a big garage here, which will be a visitor center someday. But they had all kinds of interior sets, and and then all around the castle, they used, used the grounds. They had amazing costumes. It was, that was a lot of fun. I did a stone wall building workshop for the local. Uh, land conservancies for their volunteers uh you know how to repair the old stone walls and things like that and uh, and we had a model come up from new york city uh, uh to do a romantic shoot here for her engagement pictures that was a lot of fun oh neat they had she brought up her whole team with her a hairdresser and, <laughs> and her husband had all kinds of cool braids and things they were pretty cool so they were all in medieval medieval dress for this we had a really neat um goth wedding here last fall oh yeah we don't know if we're red or black <laughs> <laughs> some people had masks it, it was very amusing oh that's funny so maybe i'll put up a pavilion sometime soon and then we can go back to having start having art activities here mm -hmm. one good way to start maybe yeah yeah we'll definitely <laughs> yeah um but what is your advice to younger artists uh, who are just starting, my eight-year-old son especially, and, and my daughter who's sitting right beside me here, uh, who's five? Uh, they're both great artists and definitely we're learning about Monet right now. So, Well, first of all, if I want to make a living from it, you have to realize that if you go to art school, they're not going to teach you that. It's, it's mm. one of the harder. You know, there's 50,000 artists in New York that want, want to have that same dream, to have, get famous out of gallery and be written up in all the magazines. That, that part doesn't happen, so at least be realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be more practical to, to be an art teacher or something like that, but, you know, practice that art. It's a really good skill. You, you use it and use your imagination. Try to 
think outside of the box, you know, we're all influenced by other people, but, uh, you know, try to think of new things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, if they want, ever want to try it, I do have an online, online painting course. I, oh, I cool. Have. Yeah, go ahead and plug that. Yeah, please. Uh, well, you'd have to go to my regular website and, and link to it from there. Okay. Uh, or purchase it on my store. Yeah. Well, my regular website is uh, well, com, but there's a couple of shortcuts. You can go to Proverb Idioms, the two words put together, proverbidioms.com or posterpuns.com, and that, that'll get you there too. Okay. Um, but, you know, in the old days, people got, uh, the old masters had their apprentices. So the apprentices got to watch the master actually doing the brush strokes. How he blended the paint, though, what, he, what paints he mixed for, uh, to make a dark red, uh, you know, what, what pigments he used. Uh, but you don't get that at college. They sit you down, they say, all right, paint this, and they come around and criticize it. <laughs> mm-hmm. paint. So that, that's the one thing that uh, I thought would be helpful to come out with a, with a painting course. You've had some classes here. Well, definitely. Well, it sounds more like a apprentice journeyman type thing, more like for a, a, you know, a hands-on trade. It was what you're describing, kind of watching somebody who's already mastered it, you know, as opposed to just sitting in a classroom. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I pretty much did learn to paint overnight by discovering a few little tricks or secrets. So I titled this course, um, Paint Like a Master. Secret, secret sealed masters can't teach you because they're dead, but I can. <laughs> <laughs> but uh one question i do always ask here at the end is what music have you been listening to lately uh if i'm just doing work outside on a stone wall or working in the wood shop i, I just like to put on the radio like maybe songs from the 70s or 80s something that'll not distract me but it'll keep me happy and keep a ri- keep me working at a rhythm <laughs> rhythm sort, sort of instead of puttering around um but otherwise I, i've been looking for all kinds of new I like to look for new songs and or artists I never heard of. There, there was a really oh, I discovered a group called Enigma. Have you heard of them? No, Mm-mm. German group. I think from the nineteen nineties. They have a Enigma. And, okay, uh, it's just very dreamy. And, uh, it's really cool. There's a, two songs are like Beyond Beyond the Invisible and Principles of Lust. Mm. Uh, and then there's a station locally uh, that our public media uh, puts up that has alternative songs that you've never heard of and they come up with all kinds of new people so i listen to them i have a thumb drive in my car with thousands of songs it kind of kind of is my man cave i go in there like whatever mood i'm in i can find something like uh, but i found new artists like um laura veers uh, nick drake jade, jade bird matthew moe mm. uh, different people like this and then i run them through uh youtube or or pandora and find similar things or, or other songs they've written and i have them, I have them to my collection and purchase them oh neat yeah you don't so you don't need like total silence to work is what you're saying <laughs> you're, you're fine with some music i do sometimes if i'm sometimes okay yeah but all right creating my paintings for example is fun doing the design but sitting down and doing that kind of delicate work that gets boring real fast so yeah music and now i actually even watch dvds and stuff while I'm oh wow okay that's fun yeah no that that, that is work <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> i can totally imagine well those big paintings are almost six feet across and i spend about uh, <laughs> i spend about eight months of working on that painting from doing the drawing and doing all the painting well great Please check his work out if you have not seen it. It's it's mind blowing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Nice talking with you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your Sunday here. Yeah, you too. Right, bye bye.
Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, RSS, and now Spotify. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. If you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to therobburgessshow at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Also, if you want to call or text the show for any reason, the number is 317-674-3547. Until next time.